It is good to be with you guys. Obviously, we are Stephenless today. They are at Great Wolf Lodge with the family. Um, thank you so much, Tyler, for, for stepping in, doing a fantastic job as always. And if it's not obvious, I, I may look tired. Don't be fooled. It's because I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, we also went to Great Wolf Lodge after church last Sunday. And, you know, my son's birthday, Parker, was Thursday. Then I had six little boys spend the night Friday night and then took them all to Top Golf yesterday. So I'm going to try not to fall asleep. You know, if I can stay awake, you guys can stay awake, okay? That's, that's the deal this morning. But it is it's good to worship with you guys, to be with you. As I've said the past couple of Sundays, I'm really enjoying this series, uh, these tough questions, these heavy questions, um, questions that maybe you say, well, I've never really thought about it any deeper than just a cursory question you know about baptism uh sprinkling versus immersion infant baptism versus believers baptism you know why do we baptize does it save you know, all these questions we've tackled the last two weeks are big questions that i hope you know you're able to to walk away leave on sundays with a little bit if nothing else a a method in which to approach scripture you know opening your eyes to the entire context of God's word, not just picking and choosing a verse because you think it fits where you stand on your opinion. Now, as I've said, this entire series is not, this is what AJ believes, but using God's word, answering these tougher questions. And some of these questions aren't as hard, aren't as difficult as others. Some are going to be very heavy hitting as we get throughout this series but they're all questions that I think will be good for us to be able to answer and to respond to. You know, I talked with somebody Friday that said it's funny how after last Sunday the, the issue on infant baptism came up a few times. And she said, I was able to respond, and it was exciting to, to hear that and to see that. So, so very glad we're able to look at God's Word not just as a pick and choose, but what does God's word as a whole have to say on these topics? And of course, being on baptism the last two weeks, you know, on the issue of does it itself, baptism itself, save? And then, you know, as we answered, no, the waters of baptism don't save us by grace through faith. But then it leads to last week, well, if it doesn't save, why do we do it? And then when we do, why don't we baptize infants? Why do we immerse instead of sprinkle? And we looked at God's Word to answer all of those questions. If you missed it, it is on YouTube if you'd like to check it out. Today we're going to talk about another essential tenet of our faith, of Christianity, and that is prayer. And so as Keith told us earlier, that today we're going to try to answer, does prayer really change things? You know, it's similar, but slightly different than does prayer work it's does prayer really change things and you know the the christian he says of course but then there's that small voice in the back that you start thinking about things in your life prayers you've prayed and you say well does prayer change anything and the reason being is while it is simple in its form this question is very intense in the execution because it opens the doors for other questions. So that's why I want to take a little time today to explore what this question entails. What questions rise because of this question itself? I want us to think about what prayer is, why God commands it so consistently and pers you know, persistent, pervasively in Scripture. Because, you know, throughout God's Word, there's no way to deny that prayer is an essential aspect of Christian living, of a Christian's life. We discussed it several weeks back through as we worked our way through the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus lays out the Lord's Prayer. And he tells us when, we, when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray, don't pray like the hypocrites, you know, for show to gaunt some sense of righteousness and, you know, godliness. And when reality all you're doing is praying for the perception of holiness. 
And so we understand that prayer is important. You can't deny that as you read Scripture. And therefore, we have to ask, you know, surely God would not have made prayer a staple of our existence, a staple of Christian life, Christian faith, if, if prayer is nothing more than a meaningless ritual to occupy our time. So when we ask, does prayer really change things? We say, well, if it doesn't, then why is it so important? Why do we see it commanded? Why do we see Jesus pray? But the sad truth is there's many people and some Christians that view prayer as nothing more than that. They see it as a, it's a ritual. It itself is a sacrament. It's something I'm supposed to do, and therefore I'll follow through. I'll do what's necessary. They they say, you know, I've prayed for years on this particular issue, and I feel like I'm talking to a brick wall. I, I hear my words bouncing back without, there's no fruit. There's not even the, the courtesy of an answer. And so they look at prayer through that lens and say, well, all it is is just a ritual. It's really not a whole lot that it changes, a whole lot that it does. And so with that negative side, that negative view that, some Christians have and many in the world have with prayer, you know, the best thing to do is move forward with this question and carefully consider what the Bible says about prayer. But before we do that, I have to look at you know, really what some may say, well, there's an apparent discrepancy. You know, the main question again is, does prayer really change things? If prayer really changed things, then does that mean that prayer changes God's mind? And then the obvious with that is, can God even change his mind? If he's God, he shouldn't have to. You know, there seems to be something that's not adding up. If prayer changes things, does that mean it changes God's will and God's mind? Well, the answer to the first question, like I did in week one with baptism, does the waters of baptism save? No. And then, of course, I spent the next 35 minutes explaining why. Today, similar, but only 31 minutes. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take. But does prayer really change things? Yes, prayer changes things. The answer to the second, does prayer change God's mind? Then the add-on, can God even change his mind? No, God does not, cannot change his mind. But then we ask, well, how can prayer change circumstances without changing God's mind? And so in order to, as I said, each question builds on to it another question. And so I want to first tackle this question, can God change his mind? But we have to understand who God is, the sovereignty, the all-powerful nature of God. And so I already answered saying, no, God cannot change his mind. And the reason being is for God to change his mind, he would have to improve upon himself in some way. We're talking an all-knowing, all-powerful God, and yet we still say, well, he may change his mind. That's not what it means to be all-powerful, all-knowing. In other words, if God changed his mind, that action would suggest that his first way of thinking, of doing things, was deficient. And there's no deficiency in God Almighty, in our Creator. But we think, and there's that mindset, well, because I prayed, God saw the wisdom that I had. We, we do pray with that audacity sometimes, don't we? And therefore, God improved upon his plan concerning my situation. Said, you know what, AJ? I like your idea better. Let's, let's, let's go with that. If that's the case, then we don't serve an all-powerful God. We serve a fickle genie, and that is not what God is. You know, you and I, we change our minds when we see a better way, when we push aside our stubbornness and say, okay, what you're saying does make more sense. What you're saying is right. And we, we change our perspective. We change our plan. We change our approach. Whatever it may be, there's moments where we change our mind. And we do it because we now have all the information. We now see things in a different light. And therefore, I now see that option B is better. But that's not how God works. Because God, who knows all things from beginning to end, cannot change his mind. 
It is not possible for him to improve upon any plan that he has made. It is this logical fallacy that you cannot improve what is already perfect. You know, the, the age-old question, can God create a rock that he can't pick up? If he's all-powerful, he can pick it up. But if he can't, if he can, can't create something so big, then is he also all-powerful? You know, that circular, circular question, which really is a logical fallacy because it goes against the laws of creation itself. That's what this argument would be to say, I serve an all-knowing, all-perfect God, but my prayers change his minds. That's not how prayer works. His plans are already perfect. We see examples in 2 Samuel 22, 31. And he says in Isaiah 46 that his plans will prevail. He is a perfect, all-knowing, sovereign God. And so no, God cannot, will not change his mind. But now you're saying, what about A.J., those passages in the Old Testament that seem to suggest that God changed his mind? I'm very glad you asked that in your head. <laughs> I came prepared. You know, we, we can look back at, at certain passages, say Exodus 32, 14. It says, and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do upon his people. Right out of the gate, you're like, I thought he's perfect. I thought he was all powerful. I thought he was without fault, but yet the King James here says repented. I chose King James in this case for a reason because of that word. Some translations use a different word in English. But reading that right out the, the bat, again, look, without looking at Scripture as a whole, because we have the whole picture, then you would say, well, God repented of an action. That means he obviously made a mistake. Well, hold on. Again, throughout all of Scripture, seeing this one verse in the entire context of God's holy word, we say there has to be a different method, a different way of interpreting this. And, of course, we go to the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is nacham. It's often translated repent or change one's mind. But that word also means sorrow or to bring comfort. We also see this same word in Genesis 6.6. 6. It's, in fact, the first occurrence of this word in reference to the Lord. It says the Lord regretted, that's Nacham, that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Again, reading it right out the bat, you say this, this appears to mean that God had second thoughts about his decision to create human beings, to create Adam and Eve. He's like, that was a bad idea, guys. We shouldn't have done that. But that's not who God is as all power, power, powerful, all knowing. You know, we say, since God's ways are perfect, again, we have to look for a different understanding. We have to understand what this original passage was telling us. And so looking at the secondary, you know, translations of secondary definitions of this word, nacham, we can understand that what this verse really means, what it's telling us is that the wickedness, the sin of mankind brought great sorrow to God. He was sorrowful over their state, especially considering what he has to do to restore him. Again, the plan for Christ had already been set in stone it was already known in his sovereign will and now seeing it coming true through the sins of mankind it brought sorrow to god so it's not that god says i should have never made you but rather saying i'm now seeing what i knew to happen coming true and it deeply troubled him knowing in advance what his creation would do knowing in advance we would fail we would fall it still brought sorrow to our creator. You know, we see also this same word in Jonah 3.10 is that example of Nacham. And so Jonah says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented Nacham and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. You know, in other words, what we're seeing is God took comfort in the fact that they, he did not have to destroy the Ninevites as he had said he would do if they didn't 
repent. He did not change his mind. He sent Jonah knowing that when Jonah brought this very short but powerful message, repent or you'll be destroyed, that they would in fact be sorrowful. They would in fact repent. They would, as an evil city, turn to God. And in seeing that, it was a reminder that this is what would have happened. This is what could have happened. But I knew through Jonah in his stubbornness that this simple message would bring change on behalf of this city. So again, in all these cases, God did not change his mind in any of these passages, nor do we see it anywhere else in Scripture. What we have to understand is if we serve a all-knowing, all-powerful, sovereign God, we understand that his actions are always a part of a bigger plan that was formed before he created the world. That is the God that we serve. We see uh, another example of this picture of God's forgiveness and God not changes, changing his mind, but not having to follow through on the thread of what would have happened. Jeremiah 18, 8 says, and if the nation I warn repents of this evil, then I'll relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. Again, God is not changing his mind. He is taking comfort in the truth that man's repentance will curb the consequences that they deserve, that he said would happen if they didn't turn back to him. It is in his righteousness that he already established his righteousness and his justice for as a holy creator to a fallen creation. So again, in these examples, we don't see God changing his mind. We see sorrow as he looks down on his creation in sin, but we see forgiveness and grace when his creation re repents and comes back to him time and time again. So now we know God doesn't change his mind. So we get back to the main question. Since God cannot change his mind, you know, we know that, you know, prayer itself does not change God's mind. So now, does prayer change anything? Does prayer change our circumstances? Does prayer change me? The answer is yes. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes our circumstances. Prayer changes our mindset, our outlook, and our lives. In fact, God delights in changing our circumstances in response to our prayers of faith. That's why Jesus instructed us to always pray and not lose heart. You know, to understand this, you know, just a, a, a picture, uh, uh, an analogy, if you will, you know, thinking about what it means that God delights in changing our circumstances in response to our prayers of faith. You know, we can think of it this way. You know, as moms and dads, maybe you've even seen this in your own life with your kids. But we see a father who plans to give his daughter a car when she turns 16. He knows at that time when she's 16, she will probably have at least a small part-time job. She, she'll be active in her youth group. She'll be active with school activities. She'll be learning. She'll be growing. And at that point, she'll be able to pay for her own insurance. He knows that's the mindset. That's the game plan. But he also, as a father, plans to wait to give it to her until she asks for it is because he wants her to value that gift, to value that car. But we already see at age 11, she begins to beg for a car. It's like, what are you going to do with a car? You're 11. She pleads, bargains, even gets angry when there's not a car in the driveway. She does the same on her 12th, or 13th, and her 14th birthday. Still no car each time the birth date comes around. But she begins to mature. She stops asking incessantly but when 16 comes she approaches her father in a more thoughtful way explains her need for a car and expresses her confidence that her dad will take care of this need will take care of her in just a very short time after her 16th birthday the day comes he joyfully hands her the keys to that car did this dad change his mind? 
No, he always planned to give it to her. But did she have to ask? Yes, that was part of his plan. And that's similar with, with God. Our Heavenly Father invites us to ask him for everything we need. A God that can supply all needs is waiting to give us that which is in his will, in his plan for us. And in fact, he delights to give it to us when it's within his plan. When our mindset changes like the daughter, when the dead again could say, you're making no sense, you're only 12 years old, that's a dumb request. He could have kept doing that and then said, because you were aggravating, I'm not going to give you a car ever. But rather, it was his desire that she would come to the understanding, not only that it is a legitimate need, but that he as her father will do anything that he can within his power, within his finances to take care of his daughter. And what we see is that over time, her heart aligned to the will of her father and approached it thoughtfully, understanding it through his eyes. And that's what prayer does for you and I. It helps to align our hearts with his until his will becomes our highest goal. That that is our focus. That is our drive. And because God is all-powerful, we also see that he promises to grant the desires of our hearts when our hearts are fully his. Psalms 37.4 is highly misquoted by prosperity preachers because it says God delights to give you the pleasures of your heart. But what he's talking about is when our hearts align with God, when we now share that understanding of who we are and what God is, who God is, then yes, we understand that his will is perfect. Mine is not. And so my heart is now aligned with him and God delights to give out of this understanding of dependency. You know, we see also a picture of this in Isaiah 30, 18 and 19. It gives us a picture of God's answers to prayer. We see that it is a requirement like the the father required his daughter to ask. He wasn't just going to give it or else she wouldn't value. It wouldn't be appreciated. She would be spoiled rotten. He says, I'm waiting till she asks at the appropriate time. It took five years, but the prayer, her request was answered. We see that also in Isaiah 30 where, again, it doesn't directly apply to you and I. It applies to the nation of Israel, but the principle behind it is still relevant. I want to read that. Isaiah 30, 18, 19 says, Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So what God is saying, what Isaiah is saying about God is, God waits to be gracious to us and exalts himself. His name is glorified when he is able to show mercy. His name is glorified when we understand the value of prayer. But you might be saying, well, God, if you can give it, if you're going to give it anyway, why do you wait till I ask for it? Not if you're truly gracious, if you're truly kind, if you want to bless me, I promise you I'll be a better Christian if you'd go ahead and give it to me. But like the daughter in the story, we wouldn't value the blessings of God. There's so many little things that we don't value the opportunity to roll out of bed and get to work as a blessing. And the same would be true if God just blessed us because he could. But many people say, well, God, if you really love me, you would make my financial debt go away. If you really love me, you would give me the wisdom I pray for. You'd heal this disease, this ailment. If you really love me, you would do all these things. If you long to show me mercy and to pour out your power, then why do you wait for me to ask for it? And if I ask for it and never get an answer, then why are you taking so long, right? And you may say, you yeah, know, that is hitting close to home because so many times I've prayed that. You know, we've all been to that moment like, God, you say you want to be gracious, but I've dealt with this for years. I've, I've struggled through these things. I begged for that desire for you i've begged for strength and temptation and while i may see snippets i'm still waiting on that blessing i'm still waiting on that strength still waiting on that wisdom and oftentimes we give up instead of continuing to pray without ceasing continue to ask seek and not but god 
is waiting to be gracious to us. But like, again, the father in the story, it's not just some flippant, here you go, I hope you're happy now. But no, you come to me because you know I am the source. That's why he waits to be gracious for us when we seek him in prayer. He orchestrates it this way in order that he may be glorified in the most visible way so that we can look and say, this is because of God and because of God only that I'm able to do this or to be in this situation. It's only by God's grace that I have what I have, big or small. That's why Proverbs 15, 8 says, the prayer of the upright is his delight. He delights in the prayers of his people. He delights when we seek him, when we long for that that intimacy with that connection because more than anything else, our prayer highlights the depths of our poverty and our helplessness, but it magnifies the riches and resource of God's gracious supply. Again, like the daughter, she had nothing at the time. She started begging at age 11 for a car. She couldn't do anything with it, but she wanted it, thought it was what was best for her, thought this was going to be the greatest thing ever, but then dad doesn't come through because it wasn't in dad's timing. But she realized that without my father, without that source, I have nothing. I am helpless. But my father who is in heaven, who knows all, who is all and is above all, has riches and blessings and resources that He is willing to bless and give, not just flippantly, but through a life of prayer, through a life of dependency on Him. Because God wants us to know how desperately dependent on Him we are for everything in life. God, thank you for waking me up this morning. Thank you for the breath in my lungs. Thank you for the family under this same roof. Thank you for all the little things that I take for granted. And when we begin to see how desperately dependent we are on God for everything, we begin to understand the little blessings on life. We begin to see that the reason he suspended his blessing on us until we sought after him is to teach us that these are, in fact, blessings. There's no greater way to teach us our dependency but to suspend that blessing until we seek the source of that blessing, the source of that strength in our life, who is God and God alone. That is why he waits to be gracious, longing for us, delights in us as the prayers of the righteous coming to the source. Because God, as a gracious creator, he could just give, give us everything we want. But again, he's not a, some magic genie that, well, you get three wishes and go about your way. That is not who God is, nor should he be treated as such. But how often do our prayers turn into, you know, God, this is, this is all I want, and then, then I'll, I'll be the Christian you want me to be. Just give me this or make this happen. If I didn't have debt, God, you know what I could give to church. If I didn't have all this stress, you know what I would do for church and for, for Christ, for your name, for your glory. We always say, if I just was there, then I would do something. But we are treating him like a magic genie when he is God Almighty, when he is creator. And because he is our creator, he has all rights to withhold blessing and comfort to those who do not seek the very source of the things that they desperately need. We say we're in need, we say we need strength, but we don't go after the very source. It's like a man so thirsty, just completely parched and dry, knowing there's a river a half a mile away, but refusing to go seek refuge to, to quench his thirst, refusing because I'm just not feeling like it's worth my effort. Rather stand in the desert, die of thirst, than to go after the very source we know holds all the answers, that has all the blessings, that has everything I so desperately need. That's how we treat prayer. Like, well, yes, God can make it happen, but... Will he? Does does prayer really change things anyway? It's just, it is what it is. Instead of letting God change our mindset and our circumstances and help us see his will for our lives instead of being blinded by our own. That's why prayer allows us the opportunity to seek after God. 
we begin to trust in his provisions. We begin to believe in him to be the loving, merciful God, the one who seeks after, after to give blessings to those who ask, seek, and not to answer, to come and to open the doors to those who ask, seek, and not. You know, we read that passage several weeks back, but we didn't talk about the flip side of that verse. We see it, you know, we saw it in Matthew 7, 7, ask, seek, and not. But what about the flip side? And it fits well with where we are today and God waiting to be gracious for us. You know, God could have said, Jesus could have said on the Sermon on the Mount, if you don't ask, it won't be given to you. If you don't seek, you won't find. And if you don't knock, it won't be open. And if we understand it from that negative point of view, that flip side, then we begin to see the urgency of prayer. We know the source of strength. We know the source of blessing. We know the fountain that all life comes from. And yet we, if we don't ask, don't seek, don't knock, how on earth do we expect God to bring blessing if we have the audacity to say, well, he knows who I am, of course. I don't even have to ask. But no, he delights in our prayers, delights to bring blessing and strength and joy and peace when we seek after the very source of all of those things. So if we're ever going to achieve the plans that God has for our lives, saying, God, I want your will to be done, but never seek after him as a source of his will, then we'll never understand it. We have to seek him. We have to seek his will. And it happens through prayer and confidence in God. And we can be confident in those provisions because right after Jesus' words at telling us to ask, seek, and not, he reminds us that God, as a good father, knows how to give good gifts. So it goes down to, again, we ourselves, even with the gift, the blessing that prayer is, we don't seek after the very source of the things we say we so desperately need in this life. Does it mean everything's going to be given? If I pray for financial stability, then what you're saying is everything's good. I'll be debt free. No, but God will give you the wisdom in those circumstances, that willpower when you want to hit by now. He'll give you that strength, that understanding that if I truly want to get out of this situation, this is what it takes. God helps us through these situations. God does give peace in those situations, but he still is telling us to do our part, to serve, to seek, to ask, and to not, to continue to grow in him. And when it comes down to prayer, if we are really honest with ourselves, every problem in prayer is traceable to a misconception about God. You know, if we don't see him as, a, as the source of joy, peace, comfort, and strength, and wisdom, then why would we seek after him? But when you understand the depths of God's goodness, prayer begins to flow a little easier. When we understand that God gives good gifts to those who ask, those who seek his face, who call on his name, you'll see that God is not only capable to handle anything in our lives, but is gracious and giving when it fits in his timeline and within his will. And through prayer, we begin to see that my timeline is far from right. My timeline is not God's timeline always. And we begin to understand that because he is God almighty, he is sovereign, he knows what is best for our lives. And when you see that God desires for us to seek answers and seek wisdom and prayer, and the, we serve a God that can provide all of that, then again, we see the urgency, the importance of prayer. We don't look at prayer as, you know, that audacious mindset of, well, if God is really gracious, he'll give it. But looking at scripture says, God delights in the prayers of the righteous. God wants us to seek after him. God longs for that connection with his creation. And he gives to those who seek his name. He gives the blessings of peace, comfort, whatever it may be when we seek him. Because again, part of God's plan and prayers to know how desperately we need him and how gracious and capable he is to provide. He wants us to seek him in prayer, to rely on him and to come to him with everything, with anything. And so prayer can change our circumstances because it can change us. 
He can align our hearts to his. So prayer changes us because it helps give us an understanding of this life and the life to come. And it helps give us an understanding of the will of God, both explicitly laid out in scripture and those that we're still working through in those small forks in the road in our lives. And so prayer, again, is not to be seen as a means of getting God to do our will, but rather as a means of doing God's will here on earth. His wisdom far outseeds all of ours. That's why Warren Wiersbe said, the immediate purpose of prayer is, the, is to accomplish God's will on earth. The ultimate purpose of prayer is the eternal glory of God. So again, prayer is not a means of seeking all that you wish, treating him like that genie. Nor does it mean we can change God's mind as if, well, he finally sees my wisdom, sees my way of doing things. He's finally come over to my side. Rather, God created prayer as a means of intimacy with him. And it's mind-blowing that God of all creation desires for us to seek him, to seek all of the gifts, the blessings that he can offer, even in the small moments of life. So prayer, again, is not going to change God's mind, but it can change ours. It can change our hearts. It can allow us to align our hearts with his to focus on him and his will. And it begins to form us into who God longs for us to be, who God created us to be. Again, it helps us see that God, not this magical genie, but now an all-powerful, loving God who can provide all that we need. We pray in preparation for major decisions to overcome barriers, to gain strength against sin and temptation, or to help strengthen others spiritually. And that's why for the Christian, praying is supposed to be like breathing, easier to do than not to, to pray without ceasing, because it is a way of serving God and obeying Him. And we pray because He commanded it. We see in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, He tells, tells us, and this is a big one, yeah, I know for me, I'd like to dwell on things, to focus on things, but he tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He's commanding us to pray, to seek him. And we see it throughout the early church. We see it in Jesus Christ himself. And if Jesus thought it worthwhile to pray, I think we should as well. But above all, why we pray, why prayer is important, and why prayer changes things, it changes our outlook, it changes our understanding of who God is, it also allows us to worship. And that's the main purpose of prayer is, is worship. Everything is done for His glory, to exalt His name. He delights in the prayers of of the righteous because it shows our need for a all-powerful God and it opens the doors of worship to that almighty God because when we pray recognizing him for what he is for who he is what he has done it is an act of worship and therefore how we pray how we approach prayer should reflect this purpose our focus should be on who God is not who we are or what, what we want. Because at the heart of all of our prayers should be an act of worship, should be a heart of worship, one that glorifies his name. So again, not only does prayer affect our lives and the lives of others, it also is a way to communicate with God, to grow in our relationship with him. And so he places an emphasis on the power and the purpose of prayer Therefore, prayer should not mean to be neglected. Prayer changes us, doesn't change God, but prayer brings us closer to God, closer to an understanding of who God is, what His Holy Word says, and what God's will is for our lives. Let's pray now. Hey guys, it's AJ Layton, lead pastor at Access Point Church. We're so glad you guys have found us, stumbled upon us, or have been long listeners. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our page, share with your friends. We look forward to seeing you next week.